leave loudly. Hey, thanks for being here this morning. Hey, how many of you uh, had a hard time getting here this morning? Hard time getting up, hard time getting the kids ready, hard time putting up with them as you drove to church, all that stuff. Well, if you have kids, I'm sure you testify, yes. But you know, for some reason, you decided to come this morning. Whether this is your yearly dose of religion or whether that did you come all the time or whether you meant to come to the early service and didn't get up and came to the late one instead but whenever you came to church this morning for whatever reason that you came this morning i pray that it's because of the risen savior now let me ask you a question i, I think it's a real fundamental question that <clears throat> that christians need to ask themselves does the resurrection of christ really matter i mean easter eggs matter the bunny the easter bunny matters spending time with family matters all those things matter but does the resurrection of christ matter does it matter at all does it impact the way that you and i live our lives on a daily basis or is it just one date throughout the year that all of a sudden we wear listen i hardly ever wear ties anymore I think that it, the, the devil started ties in the first place, amen? But on Easter Sunday, I wear a tie, I call it, I get all suited up, amen? I, I may have to take it off in a minute, how about y'all? How many ties do we have in the house today? Two, three, four, five. I think we all are to take them off, don't y'all? I think we need to make a pack that we just take our ties off. You girls don't wear ties. <laughs> I don't start me. But... Does the resurrection of Christ matter? Now, we've, we've been in this series called The Gift. I think God gave me this series kind of back in the January, December, January kind of time frame. But I wanted us to talk about in detail the gift that God gave us in Jesus Christ. Now, we talked about in our first week the need for the gift. Now, the need for the gift was because that there's sin in our life, and that first sin came through us, uh, to us. Uh, through Adam and Eve in the garden, God said, you can go through the garden and you can eat of any of these things, but as soon as you eat this, this, this fruit here, then, then, then you're going to be discarded, you're going to be kicked out, and, and, and that's what happened. And so because of that, we needed a Savior because sin was in our life, we were imperfect. We have what Scripture calls an imperfect seed. And so all through our life, from that moment up until now, we are in need of someone else to save us because we can't save ourselves imperfect can't make perfect does that make sense i want to make sure you're with me this morning first service slept all through the sermon so y'all are going to be with me though right does the resurrection make a difference yes or no thank you okay <clears throat> tell the truth how many of you sang I, I just wanted to stand up and sing this amazing grace will you see me how sweet the sound Isn't that good? I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Ooh, that sounds good. You know, there's just something about lifting your voice up to God. Why? Because we need a Savior. In the second week, we talked about the revelation of the Savior, the gift revealed. Isaiah talks about 300 prophecies had to come true for Christ to be the real thing. That happened. Last week, we talked about the gift given, Jesus Christ coming to earth through the virgin, right? All those things that happened. Jesus lived a almost perfect life. I just want to make sure you're with me this morning. Did he live an almost perfect life? Can I just tell you, some of you in here may, have, may be living an almost perfect life. I'd give that, I'd concede to, that to you. I mean, I know you guys are awesome. I mean, maybe you're just one step away from heaven because of how good you are, but can I tell you how wide that step is? It's a vast chasm between you and God, no matter how good you are. I mean, I concede that you're wonderful. I was talking to a guy this week, and I said, you know what? I promise you that I'm no better than you are. In fact, you're probably better than I am. But it's not about how good I am. It's not about how good you are. It's about how good God is. 
Because God's the only way to heaven, the only way so that we may be, be able to be saved. And God gave us his only begotten son so that we would have a way to bridge that gap between us and God. Are you glad of that? Now, it was then, well, it was last week that we left Jesus basically uh, hanging on a cross, went through all of those trials, all those problems, all those beatings, all those scourgings, carried his own cross up to Mount Calvary, nailed to the cross there by his hands and feet, that had to be un uncomfortable, right? No, that had to hurt. I can't even imagine. I get a splinter in my finger, I start crying. God had nails driven through his hands and feet and laid there on the, uh, was nailed there on the cross and he died for you and me. <clears throat> they put him, that brings us to this morning, they, <clears throat> they put him in a borrowed tomb. I've been to the place that they think where Jesus was. This rich Jewish person said, hey, I want you to put him here in my tomb I think maybe he knew that the tomb wasn't just going to be used forever it was only going to be used for three days he somehow got that and he said put him in mine instead so we call this Easter Sunday most people in fact I, I looked it up I was kind of trying to, to find out the the origin of why they called it Easter find Easter in Scripture you won't find it. it's not there they talk about the resurrection they talk about all those things it, it's, you know, who knows where it comes from? Nobody knows. <laughs> there, there's some people that think they do. But does it matter? Does it matter about whether or not Christ actually died, actually was put in a grave, actually rose from that thing, and actually still lives today? Does that matter? So whether you're a follower of Christ or whether you're kind of still examining it, hmm, I want to invite you to travel back with me to that first Easter morning, that Resurrection Sunday, when Jesus appeared to his faithful followers. And let's explore the significance of the resurrection and the difference that it can make in your life. You say, well, I've been through all that before. Let's look at it with different lens this morning. John chapter 20, uh, I'm going to read uh, three verses here and then skip down just a little bit in the same chapter. chapter. But uh, if you have your Bibles open, if you don't, you can look at it at the screen. It's in the uh, version I'll be reading here. It says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and, and said, receive the holy spirit now if you move down on down in that same chapter to verse 30 it says this jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book but these are written so that you may believe that jesus is the christ the son of god and watch this this is the this is where the rubber hits the road right here all of that matters but it doesn't matter to you this is why it all matters to you the very part of this last verse and that believing, by believing, you may have life in his name. That's what matters. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would just make this passage, this scripture come alive this morning. I pray, Father, that you do something awesome and amazing in this service. Lord, I pray that your name would be gloriously and marvelously lifted up in our presence today. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move among us in a powerful way. In Christ's name, amen. You know, if you come here today and you expect a soft-spoken pastor, can I just tell you, you come to the wrong place? I, I, for some reason, and I have a loud voice. I get it. I do. I, I get it. When I whisper, people three blocks away can hear me. I don't know, understand why. But I just tell you this. When I start talking about Jesus, my voice goes up an octave. I, I tell you, I'm excited about God. I love God. Why? Because I've been through some, some awful times when I wouldn't have made it without God, I'd, I would have just shriveled up and went away. But because of God, he did something in my life that I can't fully understand. But I want to tell you this, I take advantage of it. I was talking with, I was talking with a guy in, um, <clears throat> at Tennessee Boys Ranch. He was an older gentleman. He does a lot of the welding there uh, for the Tennessee Boys Ranch. Nice old guy. And I went over there and I was talking to him. And I talked to him this one day for about five minutes. And I talked to him the next morning. It was like... 7 30 so for y'all that some of y'all that's halfway through the day for me that's early right and so i was talking to this old gentleman and um and he said are you this excited all the time i said yeah 
Is there something wrong with that? He said, no, I like it. <laughs> There's just something about knowing someone that can be with you, stick with you, do things with you, be there for you, make your burden light and your yoke easy, all those things that he does for us and not be excited about it, it's hard for me to do. I just can't, I, I, it's hard for me to do. You know, most of you probably know and, and are familiar with uh, Bill and Gloria Gaither. Uh, Gaither, all those Gaither songs and, and Gaither vocal band, all that, uh, all those wonderful Christian songs they've written throughout the years. But I read a story about a song that Gloria wrote back in the 1960s. Most people know Bill Gaither. Gloria Gaither uh, penned most of the lyrics to the songs that they wrote together. She's an amazing lyricist. But, uh, but this happened back in the 1960s. And it came this time that she's telling about this story. Uh, when this occurred, she was expecting her first child. Uh, they were going through some problems. Bill had, had been terribly sick. And some of the songs that they were writing, the, the critics were saying that the songs were not spiritual enough. I find that hard to believe, knowing all the songs that I've uh, heard that the Gaithers do. But at any rate, and on New Year's Eve, Gloria Gaither is sitting down and she, um, she writes this. She says, I sat alone, alone in the darkness thinking about the rebellious world and all of our problems and about our baby yet unborn. Who in their right mind would bring a child into a world like this, she thinks. But then something strange happened. She, she said, I can't quite explain what happened, but in that next moment, I suddenly felt released from it all. The panic that started to build inside of her was gently dispelled by this one thing that kept, that kept going over and over in my mind. All of a sudden, she kept hearing something inside of her saying, don't forget the empty tomb. Gloria thought, don't forget the empty tomb. She kept hearing inside her mind, don't forget the empty tomb. All of a sudden, the turmoil, all of a sudden, the stress, all of a sudden, all those things that she was thinking inside her mind kind of went away. Why? Because of the risen Savior. And out of that experience, pregnant, she wrote, How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he brings, but greater still. The calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives I can face come on guys help me tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know I know he hopes the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Life is worth the living just because he lives. Somebody said amen. Amen. So when Jesus got up and walked out of that tomb, can you imagine what the Roman, what the guards around him were thinking? When the light shined from inside that tomb and the stone rolled away and the angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? I mean, all those things that happened because Jesus rose from the dead. I want to take just a couple minutes. I thought about what to do in this particular sermon. The gift um, needed, the gift revealed, the gift given, and now the gift accepted because he lives. I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm going to let you guys decide what it means to you. I'm going to tell you what it means to me. Is that fair enough? We're going to talk about this morning, just for a few minutes, what the risen Savior means to your pastor. First is this. Because he lives, I have peace. You know, in this world, we'll find no peace. It's struggle, it's problems, it's heartache, it's death, it's all those things happening. But because of the risen Savior, I have peace. It says there in John, in, the, in our focal passage in verse 19, chapter 20 of John, it says, peace be with you. And the peace that Jesus spoke of was more than just a calmness. In fact, the, uh, the Hebrew word that he talks about there for peace is shalom. 
in its full meaning, it means wholeness, completeness, security, harmony in life. The very center of this peace, though, is not peace that the world gives. It is peace that only comes from God. And God is only God because he was able to bring himself out of that grave from death back to life. You think about that. And, and, and this peace with God, this reconciliation with God, this being brought together with God, I mean, listen, there was a lot of people that died on the cross. There's a lot of people that shed blood. There's a lot of people. It's a cruel, horrible punishment. The, the, the Romans didn't, didn't think of it. They didn't think it up, but they perfected it. And Jesus died there for us. A lot of people died on crosses. In fact, there were two people, one on either side, that died on that very day. But you know what makes Jesus special? The fact that he died on the cross was made real, honest, whole, purposeful, meaningful because he rose from the grave he walked out listen that big stone that was nothing for him overcoming death easy because jesus is the giver of life this friday afternoon i attended a funeral of one of the sweetest most precious ladies i've ever known miss jennifer grimsley jennifer um, man i'll tell you we we went to we went to battle together I mean, from the first time I got here, she was in every little meeting, uh, was incredible at making, uh, putting together social events and ladies' conferences and all of these different things that she did. Uh, her mama and her and many other ladies would come together and we'd plan the, the events of the church. She's just, just, just an amazing woman. Uh, she left this world back Monday of last week, and I just want you to know that I miss her, and, and I mourn her, but for the life of me, I don't feel sorry for her, and neither does her family, because now she has no more pain, she has a great heart, she doesn't have any, she can walk, she can do all the things she wants to do, and listen, I'm going to tell you this, because of the resurrection, although she can't come back to us, we can go where she is, what a promise from God, Jennifer was able to make peace with God because of the resurrection you think that's special to her listen when god created mankind adam and eve he gave he put them in the garden of eden and made it a perfect paradise he came and walked with them and talked with them and had peace with them then the tragedy came and humanity was alienated from god they were kicked out of the garden there were soldiers there to keep them from coming back in and they had to live life and from that time till now we have had imperfect bodies and we need a savior we live in an imperfect world every one of us has sinned and whether we've sinned once or whether we've sinned like me a million times you are alienated from god and you have no way to save yourself does anybody agree with that i got no way to save myself because of my sin the sin that i commit it's nobody else's fault it's my fault i'm the one that committed the sins and now because of that i'm alienated from god and i need a savior I need someone to bring peace, to bring reconciliation, to give me life beyond the grave, and God's the only one that can do it. But aren't you glad that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life? Amen. Aren't you glad? Jesus died on the cross, shed his precious blood. Though our sins be as scarlet, they are now as white as snow. Because of how good you are? Because of how good I am? But because of the resurrected Savior. Because of Jesus, because of the empty tomb, I have peace with God. hope you do too. The second thing I have, because of the resurrection of Christ, because he lives, I now have a purpose. Can I just tell you that I believe that every one of us has a God-shaped hole in our heart that can only be filled by God? I mean, try filling it up with everything else. We try the world, we try, you know, uh, alcohol, sex, but all those different drugs, all those different things, and we try, and it works for a little bit, but then it causes us to be empty again. But because of the resurrection, because of Jesus, I now have a purpose and this, can i just tell you that i'm excited about that i'm excited that i have a purpose in life i'm excited that i now have that whole field in my life and because i do i want to tell the world 
You know, I, you know can you imagine, <laughs> can you imagine being on a ship somewhere and, and some people fall off and you have a whole stack of life preservers that are handy and you look out over the edge and you go, well, hey, hey, I don't want to get in your private space. I don't want to get in your personal space. I don't want to hurt your feelings or insult you, but I have a bunch of life preservers here. Would you like one? How stupid is that? Can I say stupid from up here? Sorry. How unintelligent is that? <laughs> no, we'd be throwing them out as fast as we could. Listen, there's people all around us. You don't know how long they're going to be on this earth. We need to be telling people about Christ. And I just want you to know, it does not bother me to talk to people about God. Now, do I say, listen, you either need to get saved right now or you're going to die and go to hell. Is that true? Is it judgmental? Is it mean? Does it push, does it push people away? Does it make us look like that we're self-righteous and all of that? Yeah. Instead, won't you mow their yard? I mowed my neighbor's yard. I got new neighbors beside me. They don't look like I do. They're younger, which is not unusual. One of them had purple hair. Good thing thinking about mine, getting mine done purple. I kind of like it. Hey, would y'all be all right if I colored my hair purple? My deacons wouldn't. I drove over there with my big old lawnmower, and I stopped on their curb back there and turned it off, and I said, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. We're glad to have you. I just got through mowing my yard. Can I mow yours? One of the couples was from New York. Said so on their license plate. One was from Ohio. Said on their license plate. They looked at me like I was from Mars. It was like, how much? No, they didn't say that, but they, they were thinking it. I, I said, hey, I just want to bless you. I just want to bless you. You want to what? Yeah, I'd just like to bless you. I'd just like to say welcome to our neighborhood. All right. Have at it. I mowed their yard. It took me about 10 minutes. I got a great big mower, right? I'll come mow your yard too if you want me to. For a fee. <laughs> it blessed my heart to bless them. But I had ulterior motives. Because I think that if they find out that I care for them, they'll care for what I have to say. And I got something to say. I got the greatest story ever known to man. I have a purpose. I want to love on so many people that they'll care what I have to say. That they'll know that I'm no better than them, but the God I serve takes me from who I was to who I am now and to who he wants me to be. Is that a good purpose? Is that something to want for? Because of the risen Savior, I have a purpose. Romans chapter 10, though, it says in verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You've heard me say that a lot, but it goes on to say, how then can they call on the one that they never believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've never heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? I, I hate that that word's uh, translated that way because it's not talking about a preacher. It's talking about people like you and I that know Christ as our Savior telling other people and throwing a life preserver to them. That's what that word means. And how are they going to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Listen, because he lives, I have peace and I have a purpose, and my purpose is to live like him and to tell others about him. And I hope and I pray every day that I earn the right because of loving people that I can tell them the wonderful story about how Jesus walked, died on the cross, and rose from the grave, and he did it because he wants to love on you and me. So, because of Jesus, because he lives, I have peace. Because of Jesus, I have a purpose. And then finally... Because Jesus lives, I have a promise. And I just want you to know, I lean so much on the promises of Jesus that you, would, you probably wouldn't believe it. You'd think, gosh, he's so weak. And I'm going to tell you what I am. I am weak. And so are you. But I want to tell you that because, that because of the resurrection, I'm not weak. 
Because of the resurrection, I can stand. Because of the resurrection, I can do all things. Because of the resurrection, no temptations come on me except what's common with man. And God, because he loves me so much, makes a way that I can get through those temptations. God tells me, promises me that his yoke's easy and his burden's light. My God tells me because he loves me to, to, to stand and be strong. Why? Because I'll never leave you, never forsake you. My God tells me in his word that he will always be there with me. That's what my God does. You think that I don't have peace? You think that I don't have a purpose? Well, I'll tell you, I do. And it's because that I have a promise, many promises from God. All throughout his ministry, Jesus promised everlasting life to those who believe in him. Jesus said it so clearly in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, I have come so that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Can I just tell you, I prayed this prayer last week when I was talking to Perry Grimsley and his family. I said, Lord, I know this family's hurting. And I know that right now that their yoke is not easy and their burden's not light. Anybody ever went through that? Anybody ever went through something that your yoke was not easy and your burden was not light? Well, let me tell you what. When I go through those things, I call out to God and I say, God, you promised me that my yoke was going to be easy and my burden's light. Either do it or stop writing about it. Amen? Amen? Anybody ever talk to God that way? The preacher has. Because I know that my God is a great God. I know that my God's an Abba God, an Abba Father, a Daddy that, play, that, that loves me and that can handle my honesty. Listen, I have promises from God, and one of them is that I can talk directly to Him. I mean, I could go through all the priesthood of the believer and all those things, all those churchy, scriptural things, but can I just tell it to you in regular old Wooster language? You have a direct connection relationship with God. He is waiting right now to hear you say anything to him. Anger, frustration, fear, problems, praises, adulations, thanksgiving. God's waiting to hear all those things. He's not a far-off God. He's a God that loved you, friend, so much that he died for you. And he wants you to have an abundant life. I was talking with Perry. He was standing on the back wall back there. Him and Josh were standing together in the first service. I got up out of my chair, and I walked back there, and I hugged Perry on the neck, and I said, where else would you be on Sunday morning? He's like, yeah, where else would I be? I've got a God who loves me and a church family that loves me. I cannot imagine being anywhere else. He just buried his wife on Friday. A lot of people would be home and it'd be okay. But Perry knows the giver of life. And Perry knows that Scripture says that his God has went on to prepare a place for him. Some people will always be like a lady that I read about in a story about a question and answer forum on the internet. We get all of our knowledge, Amy. <laughs> Not really. But in this, in this forum, this question and answer forum, uh, this lady wrote in and she said, Dear sirs, I don't know who the sirs are. You'll find in a minute. One of them is named Charles. But it, it, she said, dear sirs, our preacher said that on Easter, Jesus simply swooned, whatever that word means, on the cross, and that the disciples nursed him back to help. What do you think? Signed, sincerely, bewildered. I went, amen. <laughs> bewildered. The answer came back, dear, bewildered. And it said this, beat your preacher. It goes on. Beat your preacher with a cat of nine tails with 39 heavy strokes. Nail him to a cross. Hang him in the sun for six hours. Run a spear through his side. Put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours and see what happens. Not sure what he means by the 36 hours. I'm not sure that those add up, but three days. Signed, Charles. <laughs> Think of it this way. A Muslim in Africa became a Christian, and some of his friends asked him, why have you done such a thing? Here was his answer. Well, it's like this. Suppose you were 
going down a road and suddenly the road forked in two directions. You didn't know which way to go and at the fork there were two men though. There's two men standing there. He said one of them was dead and one of them was alive. Which one would you ask for instructions? <laughs> because Jesus lives, I have peace, I have a purpose, and I have promises that I cling to and live with. John chapter 14, verse 1 says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And then Jesus says, I'm going there. See if it's not a promise. I'm going there to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. Now, you have two possibilities of how you're going to leave this world. Two. Only two. You're either going to leave this world dead or you're going to leave this world alive. Well, what do you mean, preacher? Well, if you die before the resurrection, <laughs> you'll die once, you'll go to heaven, and God's got a place for you. Or maybe there'll be this time, I had a guy call, I, I talked to me this last week, I mean, you know we're doing, we're preparing for this trip to Israel and all that, and uh, he said, well Johnny, I'm going to sign up and I definitely want to go, but I think there's a real good, ch a real good chance, a real good shot of Jesus breaking through the eastern sky and coming and meeting his people in the air and he's going to take them on to heaven. I said, glory to God, I hope it happens. We won't worry about getting our deposit money back. Maybe, maybe this morning you'll want to take advantage of another promise that God made. He said, if you'll confess your sins and believe in your heart that God raised his son from the dead, you'll be saved. So how do I do that? How do I do that? Well, first you've got to admit that you're a sinner. Listen, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. God, I believe in you. I believe that you're real. I believe you died on the cross. I believe that you went in the tomb. I believe you rose. I believe you promised me eternal life. I believe that. And then simply commit your life to him. God, I want to surrender my life to you. And then it says, like we read earlier in, chapter, in, uh, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, whoever, whosoever, calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Aren't you glad it says whosoever? Aren't you glad it says that anybody can have that? It means that you, my friend, in your sins, in your sinfulness, and just how you are. I was talking with a guy this week and said, Johnny, I've just got to, get, I've got to get some things straightened up before I come to God. I said, what if you die before you get them all straightened up? God wants to save you just like you are. He's like, well, I promise you I'll get saved this year. Said, really? Can I just tell you, brother? I just told him, I said, can I just tell you that I love you? But God doesn't promise you tomorrow. He promises you right now. He said, why don't you ask God into your heart? It's the same thing I'll ask you this morning. There's never been a time where you've asked this precious Savior into your heart. Why not today? Why wait till tomorrow? Why wait till next year? Why put it off at all? God wants you to have life and have it abundantly. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you, God, that you've allowed me to share this amazing story of how great that you are. And Lord, I pray that we're touched and changed because of the resurrection. I pray, Lord, that the world would see us, not as who they think we are, not as judgmental and vindictive and all those things, Lord, self-righteous, but they would see us Lord, as repentant sinners who only have what we have because of the grace of God. Lord, you're not lived. You're not dead. You're not dead. You live in our hearts. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen.